actions to bring affirmatively against the landlord. Um, going through them, the first is the right of abuse of the right of the access. Um, landlord obviously has a key to the apartment. He's entitled to come in and perform repairs, um, to check to see if he thinks that there are damages and for other various reasons. But they cannot, under the ordinance, under Section 512.60, abuse, they can't use it, to, uh, the right of entry to abuse or harass the tenant. And there are essentially uh, really three uh, ways that they can come in that would become violations subject to penalties. One is if they come in unlawfully. The ordinance provides that a landlord must give a tenant 48 hours prior notice before they make an entry. If they give 24 hours notice, it's not enough. If they give no notice, it's not enough. If they come in lawfully, given, given the 48 hours notice, but they do it in an unreasonable fashion, that's a violation. Um, we'll be coming in tomorrow uh, night at about 2 in the morning to fix the drip from your, um, from your, uh, the faucet in your bathroom. I would say that that would qualify as a lawful because you're given the 48 hours notice, but it's unreasonable. And finally, repeated uh, lawful but repeated um, unreasonable demands. Uh, where I'm, I'll be coming in um, every day over the next uh, two weeks from 8 in the morning until 5 in the afternoon to show your apartment to the next tenant. I believe that that would qualify as uh, abrasive or abusive, um, but however lawful if you're given the 48 hours prior notice. Now, there are exceptions for emergencies. You need to really read the particulars of the ordinance to, um, um, to understand what those exceptions are. Um, and uh, you can't uh, view my remarks this morning as being comprehensive of all of the uh, potential uh, turns and twists of the ordinance. You'll need to read that. But I should be aware that there is an, uh, there is an exception for emergency uh, uh, entries and sudden and unexpected um, 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 entries that are required by the landlord. The remedies are pretty comprehensive for this sort of um, violation. They include injunctive relief, which probably in all of the lifetimes of everyone here will never be brought by a tenant because it is um, practically unreasonable. Um, because no, no tenant is going to be able to pay an attorney you know, by the hour to go after injunctive relief, and it's unlikely that uh, an attorney is going to want to take the risk of uh, not getting their fees uh, you know, using such, a, such an effort, which the court might think is overkill, in my view. Uh, termination of the lease and damages in the amount of um, up to one month's rent um, or actual um, uh, damages plus um, attorney's fees. Now, the bread and butter of a tenant practice uh, under the IRLTO and affirmative uh, claim practice is going to be security deposits, as Paul has pointed out. That's under 512.80. Um, there's requirements uh, in terms of getting a receipt for a security deposit, which becomes really more practical, in my view, when you've got an oral lease and a cash deposit. Um, what is more important to, to me about that, about that provision is that um, if you have one of those circumstances, the tenant's entitled to the immediate return of their security deposit um, if they haven't gotten the receipt. Commingling, um, that's where the landlord uh, commingles your security deposit with their own um, oper operating account or some other account that they have. Um, easily, in most cases, easily proven. You have your tenant um, show up, get a copy of their the check that they paid the security deposit with. Um, have them get a copy of one of the rent checks, flip them both over, look at the stamp from the bank. It'll have the bank and the account number. If they match up, the landlord has been, um, has been commingling. It's the low-hanging fruit of, of all of the claims that you will find in the landlord-tenant ordinance. It's automatic, strict liability, easily proven. There's no defense. Um, you just win, and um, hopefully you'll get uh, both the penalty and your fees. Interest, as Paul pointed out, is uh, not just paid at the end of the lease, which most people at the end of the uh, term of, the, of tenancy, but it's due within 30 days of the anniversary of the lease every year that the tenant um, resides there. If the landlord has failed to um, pay the interest uh, at any time within the prior two years, you've got a good claim. And if they fail to pay it at the end when your client has left, within 45 days, um, you've, got another, you've, got, you've got another claim. If you want to avoid uh, the complications of defenses related to whether or not there were damages at the end and whether or not those would go against uh, uh, the amount that you're entitled to, go back a year. If they didn't get interest that year, it's the low-hanging fruit. There's no defense. The landlord either paid it or they didn't. They better be able to prove it. Um, and if they didn't uh, uh, do it, uh, you've got a good claim. Now, if there are damages that the landlord's claiming at the end of the tenancy, they've got to provide you with an itemized um, statement of each damage item. They can't say, 
you've caused a lot of damages of at least $500, it won't qualify. It's got to be each item, and there has to be an estimated or actual cost associated with it. If the actual cost is given, the landlord is also required to provide you with paid receipts or a certification by the person performing labor regarding that repair or they're in violation. If they give you estimated costs, they have another 30 days to provide you with copies of those paid receipts from their vendor or the certifications of their employees that they performed that work. If they fail to provide the receipts, they give you untimely notices. It's not within 30 days, it's 32 days. If they don't give you the follow-up copies of the receipts or verification, they don't include interest in the final check, all of those things will cause liability on the part of the landlord for two times the amount of the security deposit and attorney's fees. Now, at this point, I think it's important to mention and emphasize the Solomon v. American National Bank and Trust case, which said the defendant there raised the defense that it already paid the penalty and that's all the damages that the tenant is entitled to. The plaintiff said no, he also didn't get back his deposit. The court agreed. If you can find a basis other than under the landlord-tenant ordinance or other than the security deposit provision to get back your security deposit, you're entitled to it. And you can get those with any common law claim that you might think is appropriate, and I'll discuss that a little bit later. The citation for that case is in my outline. The landlord is required to provide an address with certain information in which the tenant could give notices under the ordinance and service a process. Frequently you'll find, particularly with low-income or Section 8 housing, the landlords don't want to provide their home address if that's what it is or even their business address, and frequently we'll have a P.O. box number. That's a violation. What makes the violation meaningful to you as an attorney if you're representing a tenant is that the tenant needs to make a written demand for that information on the landlord, and if they make that written demand, they provide the landlord with a reasonable time period in which to provide that information, and that request is ignored, then you have a right to a claim, and the claim is statutory. There's a statutory damage provision that's associated with that in the amount of one month's rent plus attorney's fees and costs. So you need to tee that up with a prior letter to the landlord saying, please provide me with an address which I could give you service a process and notices under the ordinance, and then it has to be ignored or refused. Utilities shut off notices that are not communicated to the tenant by the landlord, which they're required to do under 512-100. The penalty there is one month's rent plus attorney's fees and the right to terminate your client's lease. Failure to deliver possession at the outset of the lease under 512-110. You'll find sometimes the tenant will show up. They've got all their belongings in the truck. They're ready to move in. There's another tenant there that the landlord has not gotten out, or alternatively, they're still doing construction on their unit or remodeling it for the next tenant. Why don't you go find someplace else to live for the next couple weeks and we'll take care of it. The tenant is entitled under the ordinance to the return of all prepaid rent in their security deposit. They can maintain an action for possession and actual damages, and they're entitled to either two times their rent or two times their actual damages if you can prove that the failure to provide possession was willful on the part of the landlord. 